First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, it says, Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. So David said to Joab, the commander of the army, go number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring me the report that I may know their number. But Joab said, may the Lord add to the people a hundred times as many as they are. Are they not all my Lord, the King, all my Lord's servants? Then why would my Lord require this? They should it be cause guilt on Israel, verse four. But the king's word prevailed against or over Joab. So Joab departed and went through all of Israel and came back to Jerusalem. After Joab gave the son some of numbering the people to David, in all Israel there was 1,100,000 men who drew the sword. In Judah, 470,000 that drew the sword. But he did not include Levi and Benjamin. It was the numbering of the king's command was abhorrent or an abomination to Joab. But God was displeased with this king and he struck Israel. Verse 8. And David said to God, I have sinned greatly. Someone say sin greatly. In that I have done this thing. But now please take away my iniquity or sin of your servant. For I have acted foolishly. I came to tell you today, if God hates it, we must reform it. The title of this message is Abominations, What God Hates. Let's pray. So Lord, we declare right now, your word is true. We say, let every man be a liar. I declare, let your word be a lamp into our feet and a light into our path. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you would breathe upon your written word, your logos word. I pray it would become a live rhema, a personal revelation for us today. I pray right now for ears to hear, hearts to receive, minds to understand what your spirit is saying. Holy Spirit, we declare we do not make room for you, but we give you the entire room. So we declare right now, no spirit, but the Holy Spirit is welcome in this place. So we say, spirit of fear, you must go. Spirit of offense, you must go. Spirit of religion, you must go. We say, Holy Spirit, come rule and reign. Father, I thank you that nobody came to hear me. We all came to hear you. So we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. And Lord, we also lift up Israel to you right now. I pray the hedge of protection around them. I declare your blood is the highest authority. I pray that your people will know their Messiah. I pray, Jesus, you will rule and reign and be lifted up. Lord, we trust you, and we specifically pray for the peace of Jerusalem. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said amen and amen. Well, we are stewarding a prophetic word on reformation. This is a John 3.30 year. This is a year where he increases and we decrease. This is a year where the crooked ways are made straight or wrong things become right in God's sight. And in order to make wrong things right in God's sight, it's important if we are going to be reformers and reform crooked ways, then we know what God hates. Last summer, I was in the middle of a, of a nap and I woke up and I heard the audible voice of the Lord. And, and I, this happens a lot when I'm napping. And I think it's because you're never more like Jesus than when you're napping. I don't know if that's true, but Jesus napped. It's biblical. So I, I wake up from this nap and I hear the Lord speak to me and say, teach on abominations. And so I begin to study over the last year of what abominations are. And when I say abominations, most people think of one thing. You think of homosexual practice, which is an abomination. But they use that one scripture, say that one thing, and they think that is the totality of what abominations are. And that is not true. And I'm going to begin to teach over the next few times that I'm up at this pulpit on what abominations truly are or understanding the things that God hates so that we can reform it. Amen. So what are abominations? It's something that causes horror or disgust. It's repungent, a detestable act or thing. The main words used for abomination in the Old Testament primarily are abhorrent, loathsome, unclean, or what is rejected. The primary connotation is anything that is abhorrent to a holy God. 
If I was going to simplify this for you, it would be the title of the message. An abomination are great sins or what God hates. Now, this is usually where a Facebook theologian jumps in and says something like, well, aren't all sin the same? And I would respond, no, they're not, but thank you. All sin is not the same. Tell your neighbor, say he's about to teach you. See, this bad theology is taken from the book of James. And James 2.10 says this, whoever keeps the law yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of the law. So James teaches us that if we sin in any way, shape, or form, we are in the category of a sinner. Scripture says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So once we've sinned, we are in the category of sinner. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're a sinner. Turn to the person that called you a sinner and say, you are too. So we are all in the category of sin because we have all fallen short of the glory of God. But that does not make all sin the same. See, this bad theology was created by individuals that wanted to compromise and stay in their sin. And so they tell everybody that all sin's the same. So you stay in your sin, I'll stay in my sin, and we'll just all be sinners together. This is a bad theology with no scriptural backing. Because all throughout scripture, we see abominations listed as great sins, and we see certain sins that have greater consequences than others. I'll give you an example. If I'm driving home and I run a red light because I'm in a hurry, and I go home and I tell my wife, Heather, I just want to confess my sin to you. I was speeding on the way home and I ran a red light, and I just wanted to be honest and confess my sin. She would say, Landon, what's going on with you? Why are you putting people in jeopardy? Why are you breaking the law? Why are you driving like this? We need to deal with heart issues. You need to not do this. Now, if I went to my wife and said, hey, baby, I just robbed a bank and I was with a prostitute and I didn't want to get caught. So I was speeding and read in a red light and I just wanted to tell you all of my sin. How many know that that conversation would go a little different in the shot house? How many would be at my funeral the next week? All sin is not the same and all sin does not have the same consequences. I had one agitator on on, uh, social media one time say, well, Pastor Landon, would you put all sin in order of categories, please? I said, sure, I'm going to preach a message on abominations. Just give me a few weeks. So all abominations are sin, but not all sins are abominations. It's really important you understand what I'm about to tell you right here. Abominations are what God hates. It's not who God hates. Abominations are what God hates not who God hates. See, God hates sin because it perverts people. He hates the sin that that attaches itself or destroys the people he loves. So this is important you understand this, that God hates sin. So the God of love also hates because sin destroys what he loves. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal uh, life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. How about Isaiah 59, 2? But your iniquity or your sin have made you separation between you and your God. See, not a lot of people could get here to understand this. Because the woke gospel just tells you that God loves you no matter what all the time and he's just love. But they do not bring up the other attributes of God, which is hate. And they don't understand that the God of love can also hate. What does he hate? He hates sin. And here's the problem. Our sin separates us between our God and us. And a lot of people have a hard time understanding this because they're like, well, what do you mean that God doesn't love me anymore? No, God does love you. But your sin separates you from this God that you claim to love because you cannot live in the presence of God. You cannot dwell in the presence of God and live a habitual life of sin at the same time. And the same way that God removed Adam and Eve outside of his presence, he will not allow those that live in habitual sin to abide in his presence. So we have to understand the dichotomy that we serve a loving God that also hates. What does he hate? He hates sin. So let's go into these great sins 
and learn more about abominations. The word abominations gets its origin from the Egyptians. The Egyptians considered all uh, Israel, all Hebrews as abominations because they would not eat with any strangers according to Genesis chapter 43. So all shepherds were abominations to the Egyptians and the Hebrews were shepherds so they considered them abominations. In the Greek we get the word luma, which basically means a abhorrent moral horror or a stench to God. I don't know if you've ever um, killed something or, or, or something has died or something has rotten and, and, and then all of a sudden you smell the smell. We got some chickens in the shot family where, where it's a big deal around our house. So we have these chickens and I, I, I have taken up the duty to protect the chickens. Me and our dog Mercy are the, the, the chicken defenders. And, and this possum was trying to come after our chickens. So... I helped protect the chickens and the possum is no more. <laughs> That's all I'll tell about this part of the story. And so I took the possum and I threw it over the fence into the woods to go be in possum land. And about two weeks later, I was working in my yard and all of a sudden I was like, whoa, what's that smell? And I remembered what was on the other side of the fence. Note to self, throw it a little farther next time. Okay. I'm like, now, now I know why they bury stuff. I thought, I, 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 thought, I thought it would get taken out by now. So, but I, I, I smelt this foul smell that stopped me in my tracks. It was abhorrent. In the Greek, that is what your sins or abominations are to God. The same way that we are the aroma of Christ. When we live in sin, we become a, a horror stench unto God. Now, the Hebrew has even more meaning than even the Greek. In the Hebrew, we get the word tova. Tova means a disgusting thing or an abominable abhorrence, morally, especially in idolatry. So there's two main factors in tova. The ritual sense of unclean food, idols, mixed marriages with pagans, and then the ethical or moral sense of wickedness. This word tava is used 117 times in the King James. And it has four primary meanings, but let me help you understand what this word tava or abominations means. It means what is repulsive, detestable, offensive. It includes prohibiting food, sexual perversion, pride, hypocritical worship, idolatry, human sacrifices, wearing the opposite sex's clothes or drag, unjust business practices, blasphemous speech, and evil and in general. So, so many times we think of an abomination is just one thing, a homosexual practice, but it actually lists dozens and dozens of great sins that the Lord highlights. Now, here's what you need to understand. This aroma in the Greek or this stench in the Greek, even though it, it, it repulses God, it draws his judgment. This is important you understand. So it repulses his favor, but draws his judgment. Now, when we talk talking about judgment in church, people get uncomfortable because majority of people don't talk about judgment in church. They don't talk about judgment in their life. And don't judge me is the Facebook theologian's favorite verse to partially quote. But good thing you got a pastor that's going to read the whole verse to you and help you spiritually grow this morning. So. When scripture says, don't judge me, it is teaching you to not judge impartially or hypocritically. And most Christians or immature believers have, have uh, interpreted this to mean don't judge at all. And that is not what scripture is saying. Let me show you. Matthew 7 verse 1 says, do not judge or you too will be judged. Look at this. For the same way you judge others, you will be judged. With the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. So most Christians stop there and say, don't judge me like they know the Bible. Someone say, preacher, keep reading. Look at verse three. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log in your own eye? 
Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? Verse 5, you hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye. You ready for this? Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So this is very important that you understand this. If you hear a Christian say, don't judge me, it literally means they're not really a disciple or follower of Jesus. When Christians say, don't judge me, what they're really saying is, I don't want accountability. I don't want any iron that will sharpen my iron. I want to stay lukewarm. I want to go to church four times a year, pay my respects and dues. I want someone to pray for me, say one prayer to appease my conscience and go out and continue to live like the world. See, because people that know God's word know that we are supposed to judge those in the church. Some of you are like mind blowing, like I've never heard this before. Let me show you a scripture you may not know. Here's what scripture says in 1 Corinthians 5.11. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer, yet indulges in sexual sin, is greedy, worships idols, is abusive, is a drunkard, or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. Look at verse 12. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders. But it is certainly is your responsibility to judge those that are inside the church who are sinning. <laughs> Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying this is why you're not growing in God. That you have said, don't judge me. And what you are literally saying is I want to remain in a compromised state of life. I really don't want to reflect Jesus. I really don't want spiritual fruit in my life. Listen, you need people in your life that will hold you accountable. You need godly people that say you're not talking like you love Jesus. You're not business, your business practice isn't like you love Jesus. The way you treat your wife is not the way Jesus teaches us to treat our wife. The way you talk to your kids is not how the Bible tells us to talk to your, our kids. Listen, we need individuals, watch, that will help hold us accountable that we begin to look like the one we claim we serve. What a lot of people don't understand is judgment is God's idea. See, originally in Judges chapter 2, it says this, that another generation grew up that neither knew the Lord nor the things that he had done. This is wild. So God uses Moses to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Then Joshua takes over. He's the spiritual leader. After Joshua, it says no one served the Lord. No one remembered God. No one knew his word. So the nation of Israel lost their way. So God sent judges to help them live right or be accountable to God. So God sent these judges, but the children of Israel, kind of like the church in America today, they got sick of being judged. They got on their social media and quoted, don't judge me all the time. And then here's what they said. They said, we want a king. First Samuel chapter eight. They started saying, we want a king. We want a king like the other nations. Samuel started tripping out. He's like, Lord, they're rejecting me. God's like, no, no, no. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Because watch, anytime you reject the judgment of God's word, you're really just rejecting God. You're not rejecting another Christian. You're not rejecting judgment. You are rejecting relationship with God. Watch this. So he said this, fine, but you warn them, if I answer their request and give them a king, they're going to get all of the things that a king does. It's going to tax them. It's going to take their sons and daughters. It's going to oppress them. He warns them. He said, if you don't want judgment, you're going to be ruled by a king and they said we want a king because here's the thing church if you don't want to be judged by God's word you're going to be ruled by some flesh and if you won't let God's word be the lamp into your feet and light into your path then something else will rule your life see judgment doesn't stop there most of us don't understand the purpose of judgment the purpose of judgment is not to call people names or let people know they're sinners the purpose of judgment is to get them to realize their sin and step into mercy. 
Go to the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter one. It says, God sent a prophet named Jonah to a wicked city named Nineveh to what? Put it up on the screen. He, to declare God's judgment. God said this, watch. I want a preacher to go preach judgment. Oh, that'd be so unpopular in America today. He's mean. He's hateful. I don't like that channel. I'm going to switch churches. They're too judgy. No, he said, look it, y'all are going to go to hell. And God sent me to preach the judgment that's coming to you. Watch. Because his plan is not to judge you, to condemn you. His plan is mercy. Uh. See, that's why you got to be careful when your pastor is a podcast host and not a shepherd. Because they will give you bad advice that's not scriptural. That's why those that know God understand that when we talk about judgment, it's not because we want to condemn somebody. It's because we want them to realize they are not right standing with God. To turn from their sin. To turn mercy. Watch. Because God preaches judgment because his heart posture is to give you mercy. And if you are unaware, according to 1 Corinthians, all of us one day will stand before the judgment seat of God. And every single one of you will get account, give account for your deeds. What you do, what you say, who you vote for, how you act, you will give an account. So my advice to you as your pastor is you let the word of God judge you now before you go and stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Let's get back to abominations. Now this is interesting when you study this because there's somewhere in the ballpark between 78 to 166 different versions of abomination. There's so many different translations of the Bible. Doesn't mean it's not saying the same thing, but the Bible was originally written not in the King James, but in the Hebrew, Greek, and a little bit in the Aramaic. So understanding the original language helps us to understand abominations. So there are many abominations, dozens of abominations. I'm going to give you just a few examples of it. So I've already discussed Leviticus 18.22, that a man should not lie with a man. That is an abomination. Proverbs 12.22 says, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 17.15 says, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous. What is this? That's evil leadership. Evil leadership is an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 16, 5 says arrogance in the heart is an abomination to the Lord. Or Proverbs 11, 1 says dishonest or false balances or scales are an abomination to the Lord. Now, this isn't talking about changing the scale in your bathroom. But I guess if you lie about it, it would be an abomination if you lie about changing that scale. It's talking about your business practices, if you're dishonest, could be an abomination. Now, I want to teach you and equip you to watch out for trolls. Watch out for agitators and troublemakers that will try to devalue or manipulate God's word through confusion. I'll give you an example. You'll see this all over social media where someone will say, oh, the abomination of same-sex practice is, is null and void. Or, or, or if you're going to call that an abomination, then you have to call eating shellfish and wearing mixed patterns also abominations. And so it really doesn't matter. And they will try to devalue or they will try to exaggerate what God's words say. So let me bring some clarity. In Leviticus 11, in Leviticus 19, it's talking about different cultural prohibitions for the Jewish people that God called them specifically to, to be different among pagan nations. So they would Sabbath, they wouldn't eat shellfish, they would have different dietary restrictions, they wouldn't wear mixed patterns. It would be more like a uniform that they were wearing. They would look different. So watch, they would pray different, worship different, eat different, live different. And this was what God gave to the Jewish people. 
But then if you go and look at Leviticus in chapter 18, God goes then from there talking about the Jewish people that were cultural prohibitions or abominations. And then he goes talking to uh, universal moral prohibitions. What do I mean by that? I mean, God begins to give clear laws for all people everywhere. This is important, or you'll be manipulated by somebody that is an agitator or a distractor. So in Leviticus chapter 18, in verse 26, look who it says. It says, you shall keep my statutes and my rules. Do not none of these abominations, either the native or the stranger who's among you. Verse 27. For the people of the land who were before you, look at this, did all of these abominations, so the land became unclean. Verse 28, lest the land vomit you out when you make them unclean, or it is vomited of the nation who was before you. Verse 29 is very important. For everyone who does any of these abominations, the person who does them shall be cut off from among the people. This is so important. So the universal prohibitions that God lists in Leviticus 19 was murder, adultery, and homosexual practice. These were the ones that God said, these are for all people everywhere. So dietary restrictions for Jewish people, those were cultural to the Jewish people. But murder, same-sex practice is for all people everywhere. So let me give you some practical advice. Don't over-exaggerate or under-exaggerate ab uh, abominations. De deal with them accordingly. Church, if we're going to reform or make it the crooked way straight, we have to understand what God hates. When I say hate, what do I mean? I mean fervently detest or oppose to the core of a being. When God hates, God morally rejects what the person is doing and what that person has become. Church, if you do not hate it, you can't reform it. And the reason why we have not seen reformation in the church, in our culture, is we don't hate what God hates. This morning, I'm going to give you quickly seven things that God's word clearly says he hates. These are found in Proverbs chapter 6, beginning in verse 16. I'll go through them quickly. It says, therefore, there are six things that God hates. There are seven that are an abomination unto him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste or run into evil, a false witness that pours out lies, or one who sows discord amongst the brethren. You ready to go? Church, God hates pride. Haughty eyes is pride. And I would actually argue, my personal opinion, is pride is the greatest sin. You say, where does the Bible say that? Well, pride is what keeps you from repenting of any sin. Pride is why Satan fell from heaven. And according to God's word, it says that God opposes the proud, put it up on the screen, and gives grace to the humble. That word oppose in the Greek means the tip of a spear. Or when you're operating in pride, you become the enemy of God. And this is a subtle thing because pride isn't something that you, you physically outwardly uh, struggle with, except unless you're a, a celebrity or someone that's well known and we could see it from a mile away. But usually this is something that's within a heart of a man. And if I'm honest with you, I had to work for years to battle pride. I found that pride puffs up in you almost the same feeling of, of perversion when perversion puffs up in your heart or when you feel a, a, a perverted draw or an attraction to someone or thing where you know it's evil. Pride feels the same way. Have you ever taken a balloon, and I'm sure you have, and you begin to blow in the balloon and that first little puff where the balloon kind of puffs up in the small beginnings? That's what pride feels like in someone's heart. Where all of a sudden, pride puffs up, and it's who are you to tell me? 
Pride is, I have no accountability. Pride is, who's that pastor to tell me this or that? Pride is, I, I, I'm not going to receive from you. Pride is, me and God have an understanding. Pride is, I'm right in my own eyes. I don't care what God's word says. Pride justifies sin. It justifies your behavior. And pride leads you to the grave. Now, some people still think that homosexual practice is the greatest sin. And it is a sin. And so is heterosexual sin and adultery. But it is interesting that pride is the slogan of the gay community. And it is the banner that they wave. See, I believe the greatest sin of the gay community is not their sexual perversion. The greatest sin is the pride that is put in their heart that they're calling wrong things right. They're calling good evil and evil good. Number two. God hates a lying tongue. He hates lying. I want, I, want, I want you to hear this. God hates your lies. Your white lies, your black lies, your brown lies. Your, I don't know what color your lies are. I was with a, an individual recently and we were talking about a challenging situation. And as we were navigating the situation, this person said to me, well, if I have to lie, I'll just lie. And I said to him, hey, we can navigate this situation without lying. It may be a little harder. It may be we have to use some extra wisdom. We may have to watch our words, but we can get through this, watch, without compromising our integrity. Church, God hates your lies. All of them. I was with someone recently and they're telling me a story about their family and they have a relative that is identified as a transgender and has a lot of terms to their identity that I would mess up if I tried to repronounce. And their friend comes over and they're a nine non-binary something or other. And so when, when, they, when they come into the room and, 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 and they're doing holidays, this person demands that everybody in the family refers to them in these weird made up pronouns which defies science and grammar. The only time there's a they, them in scripture is a group of demons that are about to get cast out. I'm not being ugly. I'm teaching you on truth. And this person said to me, it's so challenging every time because we're trying to show them the love of God. But they just hijack the holidays and they, they, they hijack the peace. And if someone mixes up and accidentally says the wrong thing to them, they, they, they get mad at everybody and, they, and everybody's walking on pins and needles. And I said, but you guys are Christians, right? And she said, yeah. And I said, so you don't follow the Ten Commandments? And she's like, what are you talking about? I was like, well, God's word teaches us not to lie. So in order for me to accommodate your perversion, you got to make me partner with what God hates to lie on your behalf. Have you ever been around someone and they ask you to lie for them and you had to set them straight and tell them, I'm not going to lie for you. Well, how come you're lying for people at your workplace? I'm not saying you got to be a jerk. I'm not saying you got to be unkind. I'm saying, when does the insanity end? Have you taken off the belt of truth? Do you, st do you not care about truth anymore? Do you not care about what God's word says? Where are the people of God that are saying, I'm not going to play this game any longer. I'm going to be a man and woman of God and I am going to speak the truth. John 8, 44. Do you know Satan loves it when you lie about people's genders? Do you know genders aren't even a real thing? Do you know there's two sexes? Man and woman. Do you know gender was made up by a perverted pedophile doctor in the 70s to try to manipulate and distort the, the sexual understanding of the culture? And everybody's just, just marching to the beat of his perverted drum? There's a lot of different personalities and a lot of different demons, but there's only two sexes and zero this many genders. 
It's quiet in here because we've been, we've been infiltrated by a demonic culture. Look at what John 8 says. This is what Jesus said. Look at this. He said, you're like your father, the devil. When he lies, he speaks of his own character. He's a liar. Look at what he says. You are, he is the father of lies. So watch this. When you lie, Satan loves it. And when you lie, God hates it. Number three, God hates abortion. Hands that shed innocent blood. There is nothing more innocent than an unborn baby. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Because before you were born, look at this, I consecrated you. Leviticus 22 lets us know what abortion really is. Abortion is not a political issue despite Instagram censoring me. Abortion is a spiritual issue. Leviticus 22, say to the people of Israel, any one of the people of Israel or the strangers or sojourners in Israel who gives any of his children to Molech shall surely be put to death. Abortion is child sacrifice or Molech worship. God hates abortion. Now, I'm going to take my reputation and put it in the hands of the Lord because scripture says to make yourself of no reputation. And so at the risk of reputation, I'm just going to father and pastor. So if you're not used to spiritual leadership, this may be new for you. But for years, I've been telling this congregation that's very diverse, look around the room. For years, I've been telling this congregation that you have to be more loyal to the word of God and the kingdom of God than your culture. I've had people ask me, how come you don't bring Democrats up on the stage and pray and put them on the friends and family list? And I respond every time because I can't find Democrats that aren't pro Molech worship. You don't have to clap. You don't have to like it. I'll get there. Just hold on. Tell your neighbor, say, breathe. Say, you're going to get offended. It's okay. You'll get through it. I have over and over and over said we're not supporting any candidate that will compromise on abortion. There's no compromise. And I'm not getting into the games pretending that there's special cases that demand it. We serve a God that takes all things and turns them and makes them for his good. We serve a God that takes what the enemy meant for evil and turns to good. You say, what about the case of the mother? I don't know a mother that wouldn't lay down their life for their child. You're trying to manipulate us. You're trying to get it. It's the same. It's the same bad theology and thinking that will tell people, well, can't you be a gay Christian? No, nothing comes in front of your Christianity. I'm rejecting the category. So I have said over and over and over, you got to be more loyal to God's word than your culture. Oh, but now I need to come on the other side of the aisle. Because now some of your conservative candidates are now compromising. Now some of the conservative candidates that you thought represented you and your values are now trying to go and double dip on the other side of things and there's an exposing of what's really going on. So watch, I'm not going to tell one side of the aisle you got to be more loyal to God's word than the culture and then not tell the other side of the aisle you got to be more loyal to God's word than your conservatism. Because some of you are more conservative than you are Christ follower. One of the most demonic places I've ever been was a Republican rally. Nate invited me. Thanks, thanks, Nate. Pastor Nate. I'm in this rally full of people that are foul. I'm like, get me out of here. Not Nate. It's quiet in here. Just mean, 
vulgar. Like, you don't represent my values. You don't represent the word of God. Hold on a second. All of a sudden, we realize that we have more paraphernalia of a political candidate on our car, on flags, and on our houses than you do even Jesus. We are not compromising with abortion. It is the hill we will die on. Watch, and if it costs us elections, it won't cost us eternity. Because we're going to declare, if we perish, we perish. Have a seat, I'm not done with this. I want to tell you a story that I heard. And I, for the sake of honor, I can't tell you any names of the people involved. But someone told me this story who was firsthand with the individual that told former President Trump about the overturn of Roe v. Wade. This person went to former President Trump and said, Roe was just overturned. And the first thing that came out of the president's mouth was a curse word. And then the second thing that came out of his mouth was, well, what did this do to the polls? And the moment I heard this story, and I'm giving you the, the light version of it. The moment I heard this story, I was absolutely grieved and then I felt betrayed. And then a holy fear came on me. Because I realized it wasn't a person who was appointing Supreme Court judges. It was the Lord. Watch his sovereign grace chose a man that chose justices that overturned Roe. It was God doing it the whole time. It was intercessors behind the scenes for decades believing for the overturning of Roe. Watch. Do you know what it means? There's not one man that can save America. There's not one party that can save America. There's no political figure that can save America. The only thing that will save America is a king. The only thing that will save America is Jesus. The only thing that will save America is reformation. <laughs> Pastor, are you saying that you're going to vote for the current administration? Heck no. <laughs> the most demonic leadership I've ever seen. What's the vice president doing at Planned Parenthood celebrating Molech worship? <laughs> Declaring Easter Sunday as Transgender Visibility Day. Lighting up the White House in rainbow colors in June. No. But until Jesus returns, there's a lesser of two evils. And no matter who's in the White House, we must reform crooked ways. Amen? Amen? Number four. God hates heart that devises wicked plans, or look at this, minds that think of evil. If you study this out, it really means a reprobate mind or a debased mind. We get this from Romans 1. Romans 1, God turns, uh, uh, mankind turns from God. We're living in Romans 1 right now. Romans 1 God says in Romans 1, because you've rejected me and embraced perversion, I'm going to give you a reprobate or debased mind. What is a reprobate or debased mind? It is a mind that could only think of evil thoughts or you invent new ways to do evil. It's our public school system. It's literally what we're seeing in America right now. It is a debased mind that God hates. Number five, God hates feet that run into evil or those that don't resist temptation. This is wild. God hates it when you don't resist temptation. I've been pastoring people for a long time. I've been in ministry for over 20 years. I hear people like, oh, pastor, I'm really struggling. No, you're not. You're not struggling. 
you are full-fledged give in to any and all temptation on command. That's not a struggle. Have you ever seen someone really struggle against temptation? I'll give you an example. Uh, during the summer, we do uh, what we call Staff Vision Week, which is like conference summer camp for our staff. And we're, we're casting vision and teaching, and a group of them put on little silly games, and I beat uh, Pastor Isaac in arm wrestling, and we got on video. It's a true story. And then this other video that we did... Uh, uh, this other video or this other game that we did was a, a tug of war. Someone thought it was a great idea to do tug of war in the sanctuary <laughs> on carpet. So we split the staff up in two groups and we got a little bit of a competitive staff apparently. And they're holding on to this rope, pulling on this rope like their jobs are at stake. I think they're playing for a Chili's gift card, but they're fighting like their jobs are at stake. And they're pulling on this rope. People are sliding, carpet burn, skin rubbing off their leg, skin coming from their hands, calluses. I mean, it looked like a war-torn Braveheart scene when we were done with a tug of war. That is what struggling looks like. Some of you are holding that rope of temptation and the enemy pulls on it. You're like, I let go. I give up. I give up. I give up. I give up. Watch. There's no flesh that came off you. Mm. See, when you are struggling, when you are resisting the temptation, the first thing to go is always your flesh. And that's what lets your spirit remain. It's those that stand in the fight. It's those that resist the devil and watch him flee from you. Watch, God hates it when you don't resist temptation. Now let me pass you for a second. You realize that temptation is not sin, right? See, so many people think that when they're tempted, they've already sinned, and then you're already walking in shame because the accuser of the brethren is already accusing you of what he tempted you with. But you need to understand that temptation is not sin. How do we know this? Because the Bible says that Jesus was without sin, yet he was tempted. So watch, when you're dealing with temptation, you're not in sin, that's the time that you fight. So how do you fight temptation? You tell on the devil. Men, let me help you right now. You're being tempted, tell on it. If the enemy is tempting you to commit adultery, tell your wife. You say, Pastor, why would I do that? To save your marriage. If the enemy is tempting you in perversion on business trips, tell your brothers and sisters, uh, your brothers in Christ, listen, whatever the enemy is tempting with, girl, if the enemy is tempting you in your mind, tell your husband, tell your friend, tell the person in your small group, listen, expose the work of the enemy. If you keep it to yourself, there's only a matter of time till you give in. And God hates it when we give in easily to temptation. First, uh, Corinthians 10, 13 says, no temptation has overtaken this common to man, but God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he also provides a way of escape. Look at this, that you may endure it. Amen. Amen. Number six, God hates a false witness. There's a difference between a false witness and a lie. A lie could be about many things. A false witness is someone that intentionally assassinates another's character or reputation. They intentionally mislead with incorrect or false statements. They commit perjury. We see this in the Ten Commandments, Exodus chapter 20, where it uses the phrase false testimony. Jesus warns the rich young ruler about it in Mark chapter 10. And in fact, this is what cost Stephen his life in Acts chapter 6 was false witness or testimony against him. What is the Bible teaching us? That false testimony is dangerous for someone's life. Number seven, finally, God hates discord of brothers or watch this, gossip. So watch this. The same word of abomination for a homosexual practice is the same way God feels about the church gossip's mouth. Do you know what seeds of discord are? 
Discord is the demonic attack against unity. We know the power spiritually of unity. So discord is the devil's plan to divide people to keep them from unity. So scripture says, uh, one puts a thousand of flight, two puts 10,000 of flight, and a three cord strand's not easily broken. So discord cuts the strand of unity. So now a three cord strand only becomes a two cord strand. You say, well, what's the problem with that, pastor? Well, the problem is, is a two cord strand can't hold three cord strand weight. So when the attacks of the enemy come, you only have two cord strand weight because someone brought discord and destroyed the unity that you were supposed to have. So you watch demons do this. The Pharisees did this because it's a Jezebel spirit. And the Pharisees, when they had a problem with Jesus, who'd they go to? The disciples. Then they had a problem with the disciples. Who'd they go to? Jesus. And they sowed discord back and forth to ruin the unity of Jesus and his disciples. And we see it happening all over. Let me give you practical advice. Do not let anyone sow discord in your marriage. Let me give you more advice. Don't let anyone sow discord with you and your church. It's amazing how many people let others slander their spiritual leaders and their pastors and their covering. You allow them to poke holes in your covering and you just let them do it. And what you're doing is you're allowing discord to come and it will wait for a while and it will sprout disunity in your heart and your life. Then when the enemy comes to come in, you are the one sheep that's on the fray that is the first to be taken out because you allow discord in your heart. Pastor, you're saying we can't ever leave this church or transition? No, I already taught on healthy transition. Go for it. We want to celebrate you and bless you. I'm talking about the seeds that you allow the enemy to put in your heart that takes you out of the field that God has planted you in. The Bible says that God hates these things. So let me make sure we all understand. Abominations are great sins. Proverbs 6 gives us seven great sins. So let me ask you this. Are there any abominations or great sins in your life? Anything I taught on today from God's word, do they bear witness in you? Are you committing abominations, great sins? Because if you are, I want to let you know that you are not going to get free from it until you begin to hate it. And the moment you begin to hate it is the moment you can start to reform it. First Chronicles chapter 21. We're closing with this. Taylor, you can come join me on the keys. This is a wild story in First Chronicles chapter 1. It has to do with King David, Joab, and the prophet Nathan. Here's what happened in this story. King David is in the process of committing the greatest sin of his life. Now remember on on Easter Resurrection Sunday, I taught from Luke chapter 22 where Satan incited or asked for Peter. And then I taught about the different times this happened biblically. Satan did it with Job. He did it with David. And he did it according to Revelations. He's the accuser of the brethren. This is the text where he actually incites David. Now this is wild. He goes to Joab and he says this, count the children of Israel. And Joab says, no, it's an abomination. It's abhorrent. Don't do it. Hold on a second. I'll make sure we're on the same page. David's sin was telling his commander of his army to go count the troops. Now, I would have thought David's greatest sin would have been, I don't know, adultery? Maybe setting up her husband to die on the battlefield, conspiracy to murder? I mean, David had some significant sins, but this was his greatest. Why was it his greatest? It was greatest for two reasons. One, David called it great, and number two, the consequences of it. See, when He slept with Bathsheba and had uh, Uriah set up to be murdered. The consequence of his sin was his son died. But 
when he numbered the children of Israel, the consequence of that sin was 70,000 troops died. Now, I don't know about you, but I struggle with this at times where I'm like, Lord, how is numbering the children of Israel equal to this in my mind? How is this the greatest of all of his sin? And the reason why it was the greatest sin of David's life is he willingly, purposefully disobeyed God. See, if you go to Numbers chapter 1 and chapter 4, God gave specific instructions to never number the priests. Specifically, Moses, God said to him, I never want you to count them. And the reason why, watch, is God never wanted Israel to count on themselves or people to win battles or watch, obey him. So now David is now counting on men, or watch this, his faith is in something else. Church, you will find yourself in the greatest sin of your life when your faith is in something else beside Jesus. You will find yourself in the greatest trouble of your life, the greatest consequences of your life, when you are counting on something else besides Jesus. Let me ask you today, what are you counting on? Are you counting on Jesus or are you counting on the government? Are you counting on Jesus or are you counting on your retirement account? Are you counting on Jesus or are you counting on a politician? Are you counting on Jesus or are you counting on your own strength? What are you counting on? This was the moment where David was at his end. He sees the justice of God. He sees the power of God and he returns and responds to God. And here's what he says to God. I love this prayer. And this is why David was a man after his own heart. When David was in the greatest sin of his life, with the greatest consequence he's ever faced, here's what he prayed. Put the scripture on this screen. He said, Lord, let me fall into the hands of a merciful God. Because when you're in the greatest sin of your life, the greatest place you can be is in the hands of great mercy. And this is why he calls them great sins. This is why he judges so that we will turn from sin and we will turn to his mercy. Would you stand to your feet all over this place with every head bowed and every eye closed? I came to ask you, do you hate what God hates. No one looking around. I don't want you to think about what your friends struggle with. I don't want you to think about that person in your family. I don't want you to think about any other person, just you, your relationship with God. No matter how old you are, as a son of God, as a daughter of God, I'm talking about you and your relationship with God. Are there abominations in your life? Is there great sin in your life? Is there pride in your life? Is there a lying tongue? Have you promoted abortion? Have you voted for it? Have you gone along with it? Do you not resist temptation? Have you sown discord amongst brothers? Do you run into evil? What is the thing? Abominations are great sin. But no sin is too great to keep you from the mercy of God.